on this segment of the Hangout Hour, I am happy to welcome Cheryl Osimo, who is the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition, as well as being a co-founder of the Silent Spring Institute. And we're going to find out more about those. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting us. We appreciate it. Now, I have heard about the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. I have not heard about the Silent Springs Institute. Could you tell me a little bit about what that is? Absolutely. Um, back in the 1990s, we found out that there were higher incidents of breast cancer uh, in the Cape Cod area than the rest of the country, uh, the rest of Massachusetts, actually. And we wondered why that was, and we decided that it would be important that we do all we can to reach out to our state legislators to find funding to see if there was a link between cancer and the environment. And seeing as that uh, we had such a, a lot of cancer in this area, we thought it would be a good laboratory uh, to do the, this kind of research to help uh, people throughout the world in what they're experiencing where they live. And so in 19... 94 Silent Spring Institute was born and we named the organization in recognition of Rachel Carson's book Silent Spring. I see. Well, that's really interesting. Now, how did you become involved with both of these organizations? So in 1991, at the age of 40, I was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, and given a very poor prognosis. And I became, I had my children with six and 10 at the time. And I became um, involved with just trying to find an organization that I wanted to get involved with. Um, I was fearful for my daughter at the time. I was very self-centered. It was all about my child. Oh my goodness, could this happen to my daughter? And um, a neighbor and friend who happened to be a nurse re recommended me to, uh, referred me rather to uh, a Mass Breast Cancer Coalition meeting that would be held on Cape Cod. And so I went. And uh, from that day on, my life changed forever. I became a volunteer. I was on their board of directors for many, many years. I volunteered again. Uh, I then became their event coordinator. And then they asked me if I would take on the responsibility as the executive director. Uh, which is the position I hold now with uh, Mass Breast Cancer Coalition. And we partner very closely with our sister organization, Silent Spring Institute. So while Mass Breast Cancer Coalition's work is education, outreach, um, changes to public policy to promote change that will make the world a better place in regards to how we look at chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, we're also working with our sister organization, Silent Spring, presently with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, testing the blood of children who have had um, exposures to chemicals in their water, um, as well as working with the Centers for Disease Control um, and doing some of that same kind of work, but a little bit different. So we partner, we as the community partners, and they doing the actual research. How long have you been the executive director? Since 2012. Okay. So I can't imagine how scary it must have been getting that diagnosis when you have two young children like that. And during that time is, is when you were working through your diagnosis and a treatment plan, is, is that when you got, were, were directed and got involved or was it after the, that you had been through um, your treatment? No, it was actually while I was going through my treatment because uh, I was diagnosed in um, a se September and I went to this meeting in October. I didn't have any hair. I had, was going through chemotherapy therapy, um, and uh, I knew that this was the organization. I knew Mass Breast Cancer Coalition would be the best fit for me uh, because of the fact that their uh, mission is quite unique in that we are the only organization locally and nationally that focuses specifically on the prevention of cancer. We believe that um, you know, we need to prevent cancer before it starts. It's uh, important that we have treatment and we help people after they are diagnosed, of course, and there are many really wonderful organizations that do that. But I felt that the missing piece was that we needed to really focus on how do we prevent the disease 
before a person is diagnosed. And that's my passion uh, for our children, grandchildren, and future generations. There's way too much cancer, not just breast cancer, not just, there, there are many different kinds of cancers that are just way, way out of line in the numbers, and also ill health. I think that because of the work we're doing with our sister organization, we're gonna be able to prove that some of these chemicals and exposures uh, are really hazardous to our health and causing serious issues. If you look at autism um, and other kinds of children's disease, you'll see it's on the rise, it's skyrocketing, and um, I, I just think it's needless. We need to pay attention uh, to our exposures. I find it really interesting that it, your organization is focused on preventing cancer because I find that a lot of times there's an attitude of, well, you know, cancer strikes and you just never know if you're going to get it or not. I do know there are chemicals that are listed as hazardous and they can cause cancer. And oftentimes you hear about there are like huge amounts of these that have to do that. So it's interesting that you say so strongly that your organization is focused on preventing cancer. Could you talk to me for a little bit about like what that means, what that looks like? So we're working towards preventing breast cancer, which will, I hope will lead us in the direction to provide answers for not just breast cancer, but other kinds of cancer and ill health. That's the responsible way, in my opinion, to look at it. And while it may seem like an easy task, it's not. Because, you know, uh, for example, in the European countries, we have over a thousand chemicals that have been banned. In the United States, we're lucky if we have a dozen to maybe 20 that have been banned. So we, in fact, have to prove that chemicals can cause ill health or that they're dangerous in order to take them off the shelf, whereas instead of proving that they're safe to put them on the shelf. So we're doing things backwards. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important that we be working with Silent Spring Institute. What we have done is Mass Breast Cancer Coalition has a traveling tour, which is now not touring, but we have many, many materials on our website at mbcc.org, our Let's Talk Prevention Tour, which was an award-winning tour from Mass General Hospital, uh, which has uh, brochures in seven different languages, and we're working on getting more languages, in fact. Um, so that people can learn about how to lessen their exposures to toxic chemicals. In addition, we have modules and educational materials for high school students, elementary school students, and middle school students uh, that were created for in the classroom. But because of this pandemic, we have taken some of these materials, the ones that were possible to do so, and we've transformed them so that they will be applicable to parents and caregivers and, and youth to use at home. And again, some of these are also very um, wonderful for teachers to use to enhance their curriculum in the classroom. So again, if you go to mbcc.org and look up Let's Talk Prevention, I think you'll like what you see. We have a poster that provides you with details about which of the uh, classes, modules, if you will, or, or uh, educational materials are applicable for which age group, which are applicable for at home, or in the classroom. And it covers everything from exposures to uh, chemicals to exposures to cell phones and what that means. We've worked with different scientists uh, throughout the country, not just Silent Spring Institute scientists, to help us with this work. And teachers, educators. Mm. I haven't seen the curriculum yet. I'm, and I'm really curious about like what, how do you present information to a middle school um, level? What, what kind of things do you talk about with them? Well, so in order for us to be appropriately um, delivering the information to the different age groups, we've worked with our president of the board of directors, Dr. Barbara Malkus, who is a superintendent at schools, who works with people who are curriculum experts. Mm -hmm. And so she's guided us on what we is commu appropriate communication for high school, middle school, and elementary school. And so that's how we were able to pull together uh, materials for the three different levels. The elementary and middle school were just rolled out actually in June. Uh, it took us two years uh, to, to create those materials. Uh, we've had high school for a few years, but we really wanted to branch out with coloring pages and ways that we could um, 
educate parents and, and the younger younger generation uh, in ways that will be palatable, easy to understand, not scary, but yet um, important to learn about. You know, when we're educating our students, we hope that we'd be educating parents. Um, I'm learning every day. These are things, I'm not a scientist, I'm a formal elementary school teacher, so I'm learning along the way as I do this work with a wonderful team that I work with. I see. And can you tell me, I know your, your .org, so your nonprofit organizations. Could you describe a little bit about what both of your organizations look like? Like volunteer driven or how, how that works? Sure, so Mass Breast Cancer Coalition, um, as you said, is a 501c3. And we work with volunteers throughout the state of Massachusetts who help us in a wide array of different ways, whether it be helping us move our Let's Talk Prevention Tour to libraries, going to conferences, uh, because we do have a live tour, as I said, that's not moving at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have events like we were going to have this on uh, June 20th in Hawkington, as a matter of fact, we have an Against the Tide event, swim, walk, run, kayak, paddleboard event that was to take place on June 20th. We had to move it to a virtual. Uh, so now we're having virtual swim, walk, run, kayak, paddleboard event on June 20th, August 15th, September 19th, and September 26th. I used to live in Hopkinton, so uh, I love going there every year, and I feel sad that we're not going to see everybody on the beach, um, and instead we'll be doing our work virtually, but um, we couldn't do this work without our volunteers. We have a strong team behind us, uh, a lot of dedicated people, um, many people who have been touched by breast cancer, um, husbands whose wives have breast cancer or they've lost their wives to breast cancer, their daughters, their mothers, their sisters, or just family and friends who have been touched because they knew someone. I think all of us know someone who's been touched, not just by breast cancer, but cancer. And so um, I think that that's what draws people uh, to our event. And I'm hoping that the um, virtual events throughout the summer and in the fall are gonna continue to take off and do well. Um, and so we have a mural of honor that people can put a nice flag on it. We're doing it virtually on our website. I am walking in honor of, I am running in memory of, and it's a beautiful mural of honor. Um, Dr. Nugent, uh, a Hopkinton um, chiropractor, has a beautiful, uh, impressive um, exercise program for people. If they decide to register for any of our events, what we do automatically is we send them an email and a link to his video. And so we're working hard with our volunteers, and he's one of them, uh, throughout the state to continue to be able to stay afloat during these difficult times in our world. Um, and uh, we couldn't do it without the volunteers and people like yourself. <laughs> so, um, so you have a volunteer army. That, and, Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. That, that's really awesome. There's so much energy there for people who are there because it's their passion. Absolutely. Um, so we talked a little bit about some of your educational um, programs that you do and getting information out to the public. At the beginning of the program, you were talking about how the United States kind of does things in reverse of having to prove something bad before it can be taken off. And that to me sounds like a governmental legislative initiative. I, I, do you guys, do you work in that realm? Oh, we do. You know, we are um, an advocacy organization. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've done our work in the political arena, no question about it. Uh, some people love us for it, some not so much. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we need to hold our legislators, our state senators accountable for what we need to do to get the job done. It really has been a struggle throughout the years to get the funding we need for our sister organization, Silent Spring Institute. Uh, you know, we received a lot of money early on to do this research, environmental research, and then when we started to find the answers, quite frankly, in a, a very timely fashion, uh, the money dried up. Luckily, the NIEHS uh, has recognized the importance of the work that's been done by our scientists at Silent Spring. We have a number of very uh, important published papers, and if people go to silentspring.org, you can learn about the uh, research that's being done 
and this incredibly wonderful team uh, that I have the honor and privilege of working with every single week, uh, every single day, rather. And uh, the idea that uh, CDC has also recognized uh, the work that we're doing and wanting to embrace us and help us to get the job done uh, is really, I feel, important and uh, a credit to our executive director, Dr. Brody, who leads the team at uh, Silent Spring Institute. She's uh, really um, a star in so, so many ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, hats off to our team at NBCC as well. We couldn't do this work without our little, our little team. It's a small little team. We have a few part-time people. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as you said, and thank you for expressing it that way, an army of volunteers, mm -hmm. committed, caring people, who share our belief that it's our job to do. This is our job to do, not the job of our children and grandchildren. This is our job to do. We, we're in the moment and we need to get the job done. Now, it's interesting, you've mentioned CDC. The word Massachusetts is in your name. Do you advocate in the state capitol, in Washington, DC, in both? How, how, are, you, how are your initiatives focused? So right now we uh, have a campaign to get some of these chemicals out of uh, the products, um, grocery products, et cetera, et cetera. That's, we're working on two bills. And so uh, that's in Massachusetts. So you have to start, you know, with the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. So we're working on those Massachusetts bills for consumer products to get the chemicals out of the packaging and so on and so forth. That's what we're doing. Um, yes, I have, I have worked the, the, the halls, um, you know, nationally um, in years past. Uh, right now, more of my focus is with the Mass Breast Cancer Coalition doing our advocacy and education work, and then expanding that work uh, in the role in working with uh, NIEHS, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, Silent Spring Institute, um, on a project testing the blood of children. Um, with a team out of Michigan State and Northeastern University. Um, that's an important study that we've been working on for a couple of years. And then we have another team with University of Rhode Island and Harvard University studying well water on Cape Cod, using that again as our, uh, our, as our laboratory, if you will, to try to figure this out. We have uh, the highest elevated rates of PFOS in our water than anywhere else in the state, right in Hyannis, Massachusetts and we're teaming up with another town in Air Mass where they also have high levels. Uh, and then the CDC um, project, we were just getting ready to open up a little mini clinic down here to test the blood of adults and kids, but you know, all that is on hold. So presently I'm working on uh, reaching out to figure out how we can recruit um, without meeting people in person for the time being and then uh, working on the blood draws with the phlebotomist will have to be put on hold for a little bit later on. But, so we're working on multiple, uh, mm. multiple important projects, um, but as a whole, um, I think to just bring it all together, and what I've said over and over again is that uh, we just need to figure out what we need to be doing to lessen uh, the diagnosis of cancer and ill health. I feel certain we can do better um, I hope that in my lifetime, I'm able to see us uh, get to that next step where we can really say, this is what you should and shouldn't do. Some of our, our brochures tell us what we think you should and shouldn't do, but we want to know conclusively, and that's through the work of our sister organization, that we're going to be able to figure out exactly uh, what we need to do to move forward in a positive direction. Do you have a sense? of the scale that you're looking at. You mentioned between 12 and 20 chemicals are banned in the US and you said a much larger number for Europe. Do you, and you just mentioned there are uh, several chemicals that you're targeting right now for legislative ban, I would assume. How big, how big, do you, like how big is that number? How much, how much stuff do you need to target to get to your goal? Well, so, you know, you have, you know, over 80,000 chemicals in commerce today. Yeah. And, you know, very few of them have been tested. 
we have to remain focused in what we study in order to get the job done. Uh, right now, we're, we're looking at PFOS, and in, within PFOS, there were 4,000 chemicals oh. in our water. It's the forever chemical. You know, they talked about it's the firefighting foam. You know, so you have to stay focused in what you're studying and really get the job done in the right way, in a responsible way as we go along. It's like peeling an onion. Mm -hmm. It's not a fast process. And it needs to be done, as I said, step by step. Uh, not only is Silent Spring working with CDC, but there are six other teams in the country working on what we're working on with this PFAS chemical. And uh, these six other teams have their teams. And so it's, it's coming together and really working together team by team, and then all the teams coming together. And you, and, but there are so many chemicals within a chemical mm -hmm. in some cases. So it, it's not easy, but I think we're moving ahead um, in a good way because uh, our government officials are hearing us. Uh, and sometimes I feel like they're listening uh, more than our state officials, quite frankly. I have mm. to say that. So um, I thank you for this opportunity to deliver the message to people. And if people feel strongly about something that's happening in their community, um, if there's anything we can do to help, feel free to call 508-246-3047 or go to 1-800-649-6222. Um, or info at mbcc.org. We're always willing to listen, we want to hear what you have to say, or if there's a woman out there or a man uh, battling breast cancer, because men, although a much smaller percentage, also um, have uh, undergone many, many struggles with breast cancer, uh, reach out to us and we'll do all we can help. Okay, great. Now, I just want to make sure we did talk about the Against the Tide virtual event that's happening now. And we did talk about your non-touring touring exhibit that people can access the information in seven languages so far uh, on your website. Are there any other things that you have currently going on that you would like people to be aware of? Yes, absolutely. You know, we're going to be having our LGBTQ 23rd annual a dance on October 24th. Um, we were hoping to at Jim's Cafe for the first time this year, and we were so hoping that that event would take place in person. I just don't know what's going to happen. But we do have a DJ, Shelly Cullen, who has promised me that she'll help us to have a virtual LGBTQ dance because we need to do this 23rd annual dance. And so we'll keep you posted on what's going on, Jim, and anything you can do to help us spread the word about that event would be great. And any translators out there that want to help us to get our uh, brochures into other languages, uh, please reach out to me. We need all the help we can get. And any school teachers, elementary, middle school, high school, check out Let's Talk Prevention High School um, middle and elementary school modules and educational materials to use either in your classroom. I hope you get back there soon, safely. Um, and uh, also just to say that we want to extend our best wishes to any and all uh, who have gone through difficult times during this pandemic and that all of us need to come together to make this world a better place for the struggles we're going through presently, which are unconscionable, unacceptable, and we need to come together as a society to do well and embrace one another uh, to change this goal for, for the younger generation. Yeah, I think that's great. And I applaud your work because I feel that why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? I remember years ago, people, the, the chemicals that were used in refrigeration were very toxic to the environment. and when that became um, an issue, certain people were saying, oh, there's nothing we can do, but we have to have those. They found alternatives. We still have air conditioning. And I think that it's, you know, if these chemicals are an issue, can there not be a substitute that would work that wouldn't be causing this problem? 
Well, quite frankly, what's happening is with some chemicals, they get rid of the chemical and they replace it with another chemical that's not much better. I mm -hmm. invite people to Google The Devil We Know, the film The Devil We Know, and that will share with you some of the um, challenges we've been faced with. And the new film that's just come out within the past few months, uh, Doc Waters, the uh, actor Mark Ruffalo is in. Mm -hmm. um, I had the pleasure and honor of having lunch with him a few years ago, uh, not even knowing about Doc Waters. And um, here we have a film that really tells the truth about what we're experiencing in this world. It's a film worth seeing. I, I, I don't get any kickback from recommending the <laughs> film. It's just, it's really shocking. But it's true, you know, and I've been living this for many, many years, going on three decades. And uh, I'm just pleased that there are people out there willing to come in front of the camera to tell the story and why it's important that we do all we can to keep the Mass Breast Cancer Coalition afloat, which is scary right now, because without these events, we are not going to raise the same amount of money as the in-person events. So anybody that can help us, reach out to us, either make a donation or register to swim, walk, run, kayak virtually, or support us with our LGBTQ dance that we hope we'll have. We will have, one way or another, October 24th, uh, mbcc.org, or call 1-800-649-6222. We could use your help. Thank you. That's wonderful. Cheryl, thank you so much for the work that you do for our society. And thank you for spending the time here telling us uh, a little bit about what your work entails. And Jim, thank you very much for caring about so many issues that I know you cover. Without you and people like you, we can't spread the word. So I applaud you and thank you very, very much and wish you well, sir. Thank you. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk again soon and uh, get another update. Thank you, Jim. Take All care. right. Have, have a great day, Cheryl. You too. Thank you. Today, our two special guests are David Antaki and Chris Pomeroy, who are just in the middle of joining us. And my co-host today will be Bob Hamilton. Hello, Bob. Hello, Jim. And I'm uh, glad to be on today. I'm looking forward to hearing David and Chris and see what they have to say about the technology. All right. Great. Hi, Dave. Hello. And as usual, Tom Nappy will be behind the scenes on social media, popping up when um, people post comments and questions. All right. All right, David, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Never been better. Am I in? Am I in? Chris, You're welcome. In. I'm in. Hi, you look great. Oh, you look great too. Thanks. Your hair's getting a little shaggy though, Chris. I'm used to kind of, you know, more neatly trimmed on you. My haircut was supposed to be a couple of days ago. So oh, I, I got the... Yeah. All the haircut places are closed for the next month. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm dreading that. I'm dreading that because uh -huh. once my hair starts to go long, it is not a good look. This is not HHS TV material, let me tell you. <laughs> you know what? I keep saying that. Neither is this video quality. But you know what? <laughs> when you're making a TV show without a TV station, this is what we got. <laughs> we work with what we have. Right. And it's also very, been very interesting how the focus really is on community. You know, the message is not the medium. The message is connection. So we love that. Yeah. Now, um, oh, actually, and this is the first time I've seen you face to face. Thank you both for your work in fixing my edit station at the studio. Oh, anytime. All right. I don't know. You know, everybody might not know this, but Chris and David are the dynamic duo who actually built our edit stations at HCAM, which are awesome. In fact, Woo! just a very quick story. I remember building them, you know, having them built. And Chris and David were specking out all the pieces and talking about the prices. And I was saying, well, let's compare it to what we would buy off the shelf. So Chris was saying, well, you know, usually, you know, you spend like 600 to 1,000 and you get a pretty decent machine. Then you spend like 1,000 to 1,500 and you get a really good machine. And I said, well, well Chris, what if I spent 2,000? And Chris goes... Nobody spends 2000 <laughs> 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 
and we got some <laughs> awesome machines. Oh my gosh, they, they were fun great. to build. Yeah, um, like, that was a lot of fun. How are they running? They still they're running, running good? awesome. You know what? They are still <laughs> so snappy <laughs> fast. You know, like oftentimes you get like slow down over time. Oh my gosh, you click on a program and boom, it, uh, it comes up really, really fast. And I don't have any problems with rendering or, you know, sometimes my little laptop will kind of seize up and die because I'm running too many things. But, yeah. but these workhorses, <laughs> boy, they go right through it. That's Good what we like hear. to hear. Yeah. Good to hear. You know, we never, we never figured out the SD card problem. Those SD Ugh. card readers. Huh, so did, you, did you leave a bad review for those on Amazon? We should. Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> I left a real bad review. Oh, good. So no, you know kidding, what, guys? The next but. time you circle back around to it, they're still there. So if you ever, <laughs> if you I haven't given up. Work, I, yeah, I never, I never admitted defeat. All right. So if you're ever looking for like a Rubik's cube puzzle <laughs> ponder, mm. it's right there. Huh. All right. But let's get to um, why I invited you on today's show. You know, there's a lot of people at home now and there's a lot of people who are talking about using new technology a lot mostly zoom is what i'm hearing but there are zoom. other things too zoom yeah. zoom and <laughs> what's your actually so so what this half hour is about is talking about um some tips that you may have talking about like questions that you often get from family members when they're asking for tech support from you uh and, and things of that nature so let's start with that let's start with that little uh zoom I heard Chris Zoom. Say. Zoom. What Zoom. do you guys, what do you guys think of Zoom? Um, <clears throat> my opinion on Zoom is, I mean, it's it's good. <laughs> We're using it right now, and it seems to work very well. It's just I had never even heard of Zoom two weeks ago, and now all of a sudden we're all using it. What happened to Skype? Nobody uses Skype anymore. That was that was the thing that everybody was using. Um, so I only said Zoom because it's just sort of a phenomenon in culture these days, but. Uh, they, they all seem to work very well. They, they each have their own little features. And for the basic talk to your family members, Zoom seems fine. Mm -hmm. It's just annoying that it expires after 40 minutes if you don't pay for it. I don't think Skype does that. I know. I know. I don't really, honestly, <laughs> between Skype and Google Hangouts, I don't understand how Zoom got to be so <laughs> ubiquitous. I, I really know. don't. Because you know what I don't like about Zoom is... You have to click and then it wants you to install the program. But if you don't want to install the program, you have to cancel it. Then it wants you to do it again. And then you have to cancel it. And only then does it show you the link to go ahead and open it in a browser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like, I don't like yeah. um, software that like forces you to try to install it. Yeah. Let me tell you, I love Zoom. I yeah. love Zoom. And this is, this is why. You do this <laughs> and... A little background. Oh, what's he gonna do? <laughs> oh, nice. Yep. <laughs> That's my brother skiing. But <laughs> no, I I think Zoom is great. Like yeah. the ability to connect with people through it. Um, I always used to use Skype. Like back when I was younger, I'd always use Skype to call with friends and game and whatnot. Um, but I think Zoom has really. It's really interesting how Zoom has just like like if you look at their stock, just like absolute. Like Zoom shot up. Of course, it's come down now, but is yeah, yeah it's, it's incredible. Um, I didn't know about Zoom until this pandemic, but I, I think it, I think it really um, became so ubiquitous because it's just so easy to use. Like I, I know you mentioned like how you have to install it and whatnot, but I mean I think that's why it's um, that's why it's so it's one of the reasons why it's easy to use is because you don't necessarily need to install it. You can just you can just click the link mm -hmm. and have it connect you to the meeting like you, you don't have to have an account that's that's like one of the barriers um or um one of the steps to to like use skype you have to install mm -hmm. the app on your computer you have to make an account yeah. with zoom you don't necessarily have to do that and that's why it's so um all right that's why it's so easy to use i got some breaking news for you <laughs> you have to have an account now you do you used to not have to really? have an account and now <laughs> you, you don't have to install it but after you cancel and then cancel again and say open in a browser, uh -huh. it makes you log in in order to get to that meeting. Oh, and really? I don't, I have a suspicion. I don't know, but I think it's because they were really getting hammered on security issues. Yeah. So I think they're trying to make sure that they know who everybody is 
So if somebody keeps Zoom bombing, they can, you know, um, restrict them or something like that. So it is yeah. a free account. It's like not a big deal, but you do have to have that now. Um, and I don't know. Have you? What do you guys think about the security that they were saying has been a problem? Do you think they fixed that? <laughs> well, they, they announced that they were going to do a 90 day ch- uh, um, audit on their software. Um, so hopefully that helps fix it. But I mean, you know, that's kind of one of the problems you get with a, a startup that just kind of goes as fast as possible and mm-hmm. just tries to get it out there. And mm-hmm. that's why they're so ubiquitous, because they made it so easy to use um, for the user. But in doing so, they made this, they kind of lacked on the security. And, you know, I was listening to a podcast recently about this. Like one of the things they, they used to do um, for Apple computers to install Zoom is they would install a, a web server in the background on Macs so that it could then up do automatic updates and that sort of thing and in, like install Zoom um, kind of like on its own. Um, but that's kind of like a sketchy way to do it. Yeah. And so Apple had to release a patch that like removed the web server because even if you un- uninstalled Zoom, it would still leave the web server running. And um, so, so that's, that's like one of the, that's one of the like, weird things that they were doing to make it as easy as possible for the user. Um, but so hopefully they start to fix those problems and make it more secure and not so yeah um, sketchy in the background. Yeah. Um, so who are you guys usually giving tech support to? Well, for me, it, uh, it varies a lot. I, of course I help out people in my family, uh, I helped out my uncle over a video call the other day. Um, I help out some people in my family. I even have um, gone over to some people in Westboro who I know. and I drive over there and go to their house and help them. Uh, but I used to be a lot more active in that I worked at the IT department at Northeastern. So yep. I helped a lot of people there. Yeah, um, yeah. So we saw some interesting things there. But it's us- uh, usually these days it's just people I know. And it's not usually anything too time consuming mostly just uh hey mm-hmm. how do you do this on the software how do you do that etc um how about you david yeah same thing family friends um recently we set up a zoom call for my grandmother's 90th birthday um yeah. and my dad set it up and so he was asking me how to how to use zoom um excuse me um but yeah i mean i didn't have to help him that much um Again, because Zoom is pretty straightforward, pretty easy to use. But um, I told him set a password <laughs> so that you don't get, you know, Zoom bombed, like you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> I even tried it. I, I even tried it once. I just typed in a random nine digit um, meeting ID and I got into someone's meeting because I didn't set a password. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. What'd you say? What were they meeting about? <laughs> oh, I don't know. It didn't, the meeting wasn't started, but I, uh... I, I was able to connect to the meeting. I think you, I think you can't have a meeting without a password anymore, unless I notice if you click the link that somebody sends you and if it opens zoom, then you don't have to type in the password. I believe that's just part of it. But if you send somebody a link and they don't have zoom installed, they're going to have to have that password. I know the school system HPS is using this and Mm -hmm. it was so funny. So Everybody's getting ready. All the teachers are learning how to do this. And then Monday morning, it starts. And Monday morning, the director of technology, <laughs> um, Mr. Ghosh, emails everybody saying, so over the weekend, Zoom makes you now have to have a password. So here's what you have to do. Yeah. <laughs> and on Tuesday, he, he emailed out and he said, well, that was fun. Let's do it all again <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> so, so David. I feel- yeah. David, did you and Chris yeah. have your own account for Zoom, or are you using using something from school or from a business that you've worked at? I know my daughter and I mean my granddaughters have their own Zoom accounts from their schools, and I, they've been able to set up Zoom chats and meetings with various members of the family on their own without worrying about the forty minute time. Yeah, I, I have my own Zoom account. I mean, it's, you know, it's not that hard to make and the 40 minute thing it's kind of interesting because it, sometimes it says like oh thanks for upgrading even though you didn't upgrade so i think that's something yeah. that maybe they just for this uh pandemic that we're in maybe just did that 
Mm. Yeah, I just made a personal account of mine, but I will say I, I have a lot of other accounts through the schools, and that is very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Tom's signaling that he's got something to say. Well, folks, uh, we are taking questions or comments on our YouTube page as well as our Facebook page. Uh, you can comment on the YouTube live stream. Uh, but David, your mother wants to know why you didn't tell her you're a featured guest today. <laughs> it was uh, it was a secret. I didn't I didn't I didn't want any external pressure, you know. <laughs> oh, I know your mom. She's she's so so pressureful. <laughs> Is she standing in the background right now telling yeah. you to say that? <laughs> no. <laughs> she commented on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's well, so funny. Tom, isn't that uh... Uh, a good chance to mention that if anybody's interested in who our guests might be on the Hopkins and Hangout, they can always go to our HCAM webpage and find out. Well, there you go. <laughs> I love that man so much. <laughs> good job. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> yes, we're working really hard to, we're putting more information on there now. We just switched how we go out on YouTube. So we have events now, so you can see in advance how far it'll be until uh, the next show that we're doing. Mm. So we're trying to get more information out there to let people know. Nice. All right. Nice. Now, are you guys worried about what may be happening in the future with the availability of laptops? I've been reading, my wife's been telling me, and she's been reading too, that they think that, you know, once this whole coronavirus thing starts to ebb, there's going to be a, a shortage of laptops because parts and pieces or whatever are going to be in short supply. Have you heard anything about that? Chris? Well, <clears throat> I don't really, uh, I don't really read the news that much. So I haven't heard about that, but I'll give my two cents on it. I think that that's a very real possibility. Um, but we actually bought a laptop a few weeks ago to work at home. So I feel like even though the supply might be dropping, in the near future for computer parts, I think the demand for computers spiked significantly right now. So uh -huh. if they're not experiencing a shortage right now, then I don't think it'll be that big of a problem later because in a month or two, everybody already bought their computers. They mm -hmm. don't even want to use their computers anymore. They want to go outside. So I think if anything, it, it'll be, the demand is going to go down with the supply in the future. Right. My right. econ teacher would be so happy right now. <laughs> so you just bought one. That's so interesting. Uh, Chris, tell us about the vetting process and what you oh, ended up with. Oh, let me tell you. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was actually for my father because he had to start working from home. And he didn't need anything that powerful. He just needed something that he could log on to his work uh, remote desktop with. So we went to Best Buy and we took a look at the offerings and I wanted something in like the 600 to $700 range because if it was, um, if it was any cheaper than that, it, it might actually be slow and annoying to use. But if it was any more expensive than that, then that would be kind of a waste of money. So we went in and uh, I said, oh, so I, I, I like Dell and the guy showed me a bunch of expensive Dell computers. And I said, I don't like Dell anymore. Show me something else. So we went over and got a, an Asus computer uh, for uh, $700, I think. Nope. Uh, the most important thing I was looking for was that it had a SSD, a solid state drive. Yeah. Then it would be a lot faster. Than that SSD. Wait a minute. Do they still sell computers that don't have SSDs in them? Exactly. <laughs> wow. I think they might. Yeah. So. Wow. That's what I was. That was my main criteria. Have you guys ever? Uh... Oh, actually. So, you know what? I, I, I was looking at Dell's a while ago. I originally used to buy Dell computers and then something happened. And I did not like them. And I went to HP. And then I was looking for a laptop and I just, this, the XPS um, laptop just looks so great. I actually had to get one and I've been very, very happy with that laptop. Um, my wife bought the, the 15 inch version of that mm. and you know, there's, there's been like an issue that I think they all know about because they just say, oh, yeah, send it in and we'll fix it. And then I've been really happy with mine. Have you guys thought about Chromebooks or ever experienced a Chromebook? Mm. I have experienced Chromebooks. <laughs> I have. Yes. At where I used to work a couple of years ago <laughs> at the boat, the boathouse here in Hoppington, we use Chromebooks as our uh, POS system. And um, uh, it. 
it's okay. They're, mm-hmm. you know, okay. I would not buy, I would not, I would not buy one personally <laughs> because currently, um, at least I think though, I believe they're starting to transition to more, um, um, more traditional laptop software as in like, it's really the OS Chrome OS. That's really restrictive as in you can only run like apps, mm. um, like that run on Chromium, which is like what it's all run off of. Yeah. Uh, and like Google Chrome. So it's re- you're really restrictive. You can't just like run like normal PC applications. So that's why it's kind of um, annoying. Yeah. Limiting, shall we say. Yeah. yeah. So I personally would not buy one. Mm. And I would not recommend other people buy one. <laughs> yeah. Unless you really know what you want to use it for, then maybe it's fine. But if you want, if you're looking for a computer, then I would recommend not. Um, I also really like Dell computers. I was the Dell sales rep at Northeastern. Um, oh. and had to fix all the hardware broken computers there. Mm-hmm. So they're built pretty well and they're reasonably priced. Yeah. Not sponsored by Dell. <laughs> Neither am I. Yep. Neither I have I. a Dell as well. That was my new laptop last summer. I'm on it right now. It's great. All right. Let's take the full survey. Bob, what do you got? <laughs> I've got an Aspire 5 now, but I've had two Dells and uh, a Gateway. If any uh, of you remember those, that I was think they were bought by ago. HP. So, yeah. No, uh, I'm satisfied that, with what I have, but uh, I don't know if there's different uh, categories of computers. I know you, Chris, you categorize them by price, but uh, if you weren't doing it by price, how else would you categorize it? Speed, the amount of memory, the storage. I would, uh, yeah, speed, memory. It, those, those are really the the main ones of storage storage type is really the the big one these days because solid state drives are a lot faster um, but when they say speed is that how fast you throw it against the wall when it doesn't work <laughs> yeah <laughs> it can be they don't usually advertise that one though yeah <laughs> bob is old school yeah. <laughs> if it doesn't yeah. work hit it harder right and exactly yeah. uh, how do you compare them on speed because most times when you see them talking about things they will say oh the i5 series or they just have a bunch of gobbledygook numbers and names um yeah how do you really you really have to know what you're talking about to know what they're talking about um so i can look at something and say okay yeah that one's probably a lot faster but no anybody who hasn't you know had a job in it before has no idea what that means so um Basically, higher numbers mean better, and that's really all that I can. That's as specific as I can be. No kidding. And what are the two? In, Intel and what's the other chip maker? AMD. AMD. Yeah, yeah. Have you noticed any difference in those, or have you had experience comparing? Well, actually, the new laptop that we bought it had an AMD processor in it, which uh, was a, like a first for me because AMD was really trailing behind Intel recently especially in the laptop marketplace. But now I felt comfortable enough buying a laptop with an AMD processor. So mm. big changes. They made a big comeback. Oh. Yeah, David. What? What did you say? Sorry. No, no, I was saying they made a big comeback AMD. Oh, a couple yeah. of years ago. I, I, uh, was wish I was, I was thinking about buying stock in AMD when they were, um, in 2018 before they announced their new Ryzen line, but I did not. <laughs> I didn't even think their stock went up that much, though. Oh, right. And, um, and, I mean, in 2018, it was like 20 bucks a share. And now it's like um, around a hot, over 100, I believe. Okay. All right. So corrected. not a bad. <laughs> not a bad premium there. <laughs> oh, I'm, nope. I'm kidding. F- 54. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Chris, um, what's the speed of your dad's laptop? What's its processor speed? Oh, beats me. Uh, it's. I think it's... Um, an i5, core i5, so it's got four cores and probably three gigahertz at least. Oh, really? That's pretty good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Sorry, I said core i5. It's an AMD. Okay. No, that's but that's true. good. It's, uh... it's basically equivalent to a core i5. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you think if you just pay attention to the uh, gigahertz that that is a good indication or... Or the, the, or is it like a totally separate but equally important attribute as how many cores and stuff like that? 
It's uh, uh, it really depends on what you want to do with your computer because you only need the extra cores if you can, if you're running programs that take advantage of them. So if you're just browsing the internet, having more cores isn't really going to help unless um unless Chrome can spread the workload across a lot of cores. Like if if you have a, a bunch of tabs open, which I don't yeah. know actually. Maybe and you David know what? Is. I, I keep hearing about, you keep hearing about that, you know, oh, you know, your computer's blocked out, you have so many tabs open. How many tabs are too many tabs? Ask David. Hi, <laughs> right, David. I'm How many tabs you. are too many tabs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I love my tabs. Let me tell you, I use Chrome and I love my tabs. Currently, I have open um, 66 tabs. <laughs> That's a lot of tabs. And David. so I would say maybe like a hundred is too many. Um, of course, you gotta you gotta watch out for your memory. Make sure you're not using too much, or you're gonna have some issues. Yeah, I actually I have an add-on to Chrome that I, I found many years ago that I love. It's called Tabs Outliner, and what it does is it organizes all your tabs, and um, you can you can you can close the tabs and it'll save them. You can group them. So like I have groups of tabs for like when I'm in school or in classes, I have like a group of tabs for each class. And then I can open up that group to go back to all the things relevant to that class. And um, yeah, I use, so I use a lot of tabs. I'm not shy about that. I, was I don't just, use a lot of tabs. No, I don't use a lot of tabs either. Though <laughs> uh, I will be honest with you. My daughter made a, made a face at you, David, when you said a hundred tabs is too many tabs. <laughs> <laughs> Because apparently it's not for her. But oh, I was just okay. reading just the other day that the latest Google Chrome update has a new tab wrangling feature that this person was very enamored with. Oh, really? Yeah. Did I know uh, that? Know that. I wonder I how it stacks up against the, the famed tab manager. I yeah, know. I'll have I to know. take a look. I'll have to take a look. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah. when you are helping your family and helping your friends... Um, other than the basics of installing Zoom, which, you know, it's not really that bad. You just kind of follow the prompts. Do you have any um, suggestions that you give them about using, um, about using Zoom? Because that seems to be the most ubiquitous one right now. And you may have this one, but I'm going to give this. This is my favorite one that people say, oh, wow. And that is when you're muted. You can press the space bar to momentarily unmute yourself. That's my favorite. Like push to talk? Yes, like push wow, to okay. talk. Wow, okay. I didn't yeah. know that. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just muted my video. That's what I did. <laughs> so I love that one because everybody, you know, you're coughing and your people are making noise. And that's a really that's nice good. way to uh, yeah. manage that. Yeah, I am by no means a Zoom expert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I know how to use it. Uh, I guess my out. recommendation would be uh, if you're on an important video call, like with your uh, business associates, um, if you're done with the call, it's never a bad idea to put a sticky note on the camera just to, just to be sure. I mean, oh, even somebody it, as savvy as me is saying yeah. that because it's yeah. really easy to accidentally leave it running. So No kidding. I wouldn't take any shame in putting a sticky note All on right. the camera. And so you're doing that just because people are running, not because of this concern that somebody's going to um, hijack your webcam and turn it on without you knowing. <clears throat> I still don't have an answer to that, but I don't, I don't leave it on all the time. So I guess that is my answer. Yeah. It's really yeah. more to just prevent any embarrassment of uh, insulting your boss right after uh, you have a meeting. Oh my gosh. Those, these, you must, though, I can't even say it. There are some, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some examples out there of people having mistakes there was yep. one this person was having a meeting and uh, her boss turned herself into a potato and didn't know how to turn that <laughs> filter off so she had to do the whole meeting as a potato <laughs> <laughs> that's why we like zoom oh my gosh it's, yeah, i love zoom yeah you know what i keep saying um one of the best uses of this invention called the internet is the collected wit and wisdom <laughs> of our society. Because as a whole, we are hysterically funny. 
Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. If I if I might uh, interject, uh, this Sunday I skyped with uh, my daughters and granddaughters down in uh, Maryland, and my youngest granddaughter is in fourth grade, and I asked her how she liked doing her homework and classwork on Zoom because that's what they use. She said, "Well, it's fine, except." when Jason takes over the zoom and locks out the teacher and then starts putting <laughs> his own pictures up, then we don't like it because we can, that's fourth graders for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know fourth graders. All right, guys. Well, this half hour just flew right by and um, I'd like to have you back to, to talk more and like talk about your experiences now finishing out this year um, online. Yeah. And, and how life is going for you guys. So definitely we'll be in touch. And thanks so much. Thanks for all you do. Yes. No problem. Thank Our you. Pleasure. Thank you very Say much. Say hello to your mother for me, David. <laughs> Will do. Yeah, me too. Good morning. I'm Eric Cardi with the Hopkinton Water Sewer Department. And today we'd like to go over some water tips to help you in your home check for leaks and show you some important uh, features of the water system and how you can help uh, protect in the, in the event that you do have an emergency. Uh, so the board we have here is just kind of a demonstration of the water system and how the water gets into your home. Uh, from the water main, we have a line that comes into your property. And right at the property line, we have a shutoff called the curb stop right here. And that's something that we're able to access in the event that uh, your valve inside the home does not work. So we can shut that off in any emergency. So one of the most important things for every homeowner that has uh, municipal water to know is where that main shutoff valve is in your home. Generally that line is coming in facing uh, off the street. So it'd be in your cellar uh, most likely and it's on the side where the water line faces the street coming in. This valve right here is before your water meter. And what you wanna do with that is just make sure that that turns, it's a quarter turn valve in order to shut and that'll shut the whole supply off in your house. So if you ever had a uh, pipe that broke inside or if you had uh, a problem with a plumbing issue and you, in an, any emergency, that's where you'd go to first shut off your water and that'll isolate your whole house for you. Uh, right next to that is the water meter and the water meter can be one of the, uh, the best tools for you as a, a homeowner, a resident uh, or businesses in order to make sure that uh, the, you have no internal leaks in the house. So the water meters read almost like a car odometer, the numbers go across. And what we recommend is every now and then, when you know that you're not running anything in the house, the dishwashers are off, washing machines are all off, is just to take a, a meter reading on that water meter, wait an hour or two, then come back and take another reading. If you see that that reading has changed, then you know that something is leaking. And nine times out of 10, it's a toilet. Well, most of our high water calls are for leaking toilets and they can use upwards of 200 gallons a night. Uh, most people, think that they would hear the toilet running, but what happens is the tank will actually drain down into the bowl, and it's not until that tank is empty that it actually kicks on and refills again. So you may not be uh, near that and able to hear it when that actually ends up being emptied out. So we recommend that you, you do this check in order to help uh, make sure that you don't have anything leaking in the house. Also, our other number one call starting this time of year is for high bills is for water sprinkler use. And again, water meter is a great tool for seeing how much water you're actually putting out on the lawn. Uh, the recommendation is for about an inch of water uh, a week for your lawn and this will give you a good indication of how much water is going out. So again, read, take a meter reading on that after your sprinkler system runs, you can come back, check the readings uh, that are in cubic feet and there's a simple calculation, one cubic foot is uh, 7.48 gallons and that will give you an idea of how much water is actually going out on the lawn. Uh, so those are two of our biggest calls for, for um, high water use. and. This water meter here will give you a good indication of what's going on in and outside of the house. Uh, one of the other things that we uh, recommend also is uh, uh, during this time of year is uh, to keep up with our news feed. We have a lot of things going on this time of year. We have uh, several hydrant flushing going on. A lot of businesses are required to do fire flow testing. And when that happens, that can stir up the system. So we try to give everybody as much notice as possible. And we put that out on our Twitter feed at uh, Hopkinton uh, Water. And we also do it, uh, if you want to get it via email, uh, there's a uh, link that we'll provide at the end of this that will give you an opportunity to sign up for our news feed. And again, we, we don't uh, inundate uh, your email with uh, 
notices. We only put out the important notices that uh, if there's a water break and there's going to be discoloration or some other important news so that you can re receive that directly uh, via email. Uh, so that's it for now and thank you for watching.